students be going over forest ecophysiology. And then this afternoon in the lab, we'll be seeing a number of stands out of the experimental work. So you'll be able to uh, apply some of what we're learning here, just to see stands of different age, different structure this afternoon. We'll be able to link that in with what we covered last week, focusing more on stand structures and stand dynamics. So again, we're in this unit where we're focusing primarily on the ecological aspects of silviculture. We can get quite as much into the factors. And so what I want to start off with is looking at um, some data. This is very simple data, but it's looking at forests across the latitude. Uh, latitudes here on the x-axis, y-axis is the ground biomass in metric tons. So what you see here is the tropical forests, around 250 metric tons per hectare of carbon. Boreal forests are around 100 tons per hectare of carbon. And they're showing us an example here in the temperate eco region. Um, the Central Highlands of Victoria, that's in Australia. This is a eucalyptus regnans forest. And they're showing it at 1,800 metric tons of carbon per hectare. Now, this is an extreme for this region, the tropical. And the boreal region is kind of showing these averages. This is about the, the greatest frustration you get anywhere on the planet in biomass. If you look at the actual average, this is what you see. But what we'll do is now we can just connect the two things. Oh, stop the two people, right? I think if most of us just had to guess right off the bat. Right, yeah, so temperature is ideal for tree growth pretty much all the time, very uniform temperature throughout the year, so the growing season in some areas in the tropics is basically year-round, lots of precipitation, you may be getting 60, 70, 80 inches of rain a year, so there's ample precipitation, so I think a, a lot of us would think this would be greater than the temperate region, where we know we do have winters, you know, so the growing season is definitely going to be shorter. So what might be causing less overall carbon stored in biomass in the tropical region? And these are all looking at native unmanaged forests. So we're not looking at more timber harvesting in one region or another in this graph. This is a native unmanaged forest. So if we look at the soil, um, you certainly have many oxisols in the tropical region. Oxisols tend to be pretty nutrient poor on a you know cubic foot of soil basis on a per unit soil basis um, they're so heavily weathered that even the clays will break down into iron and aluminum sesquoxides so they just don't have the capacity to store many nutrients but because they're so heavily weathered some of these soils are 50 to 100 feet deep so they can have tremendous depth and over that depth trees will root pretty much as deep as you want to look for their roots and so over that depth they end up having Plenty of soil nutrition is what we tend to find. So, so I, I don't think soil nutrients are necessarily driving this. Within each of these regions, you're going to have more productive soils and less productive soils. But what else could be causing less productivity in the tropics first than we would anticipate? So you've got competition. That's certainly the case. So if we go and we look in some tropical forests, you know, you could find thousands of trees uh, per acre. But if you go up to the boreal forest, you can also find thousands of trees per acre. And in the temperate forest, if you go in, you know, we'll see some stands today where they're probably in there at thousands of trees per acre. So you, you can get that high density in any of these regions causing a lot of competition. Yeah. Would you not find uh, things left to its own devices, like you see with the California wildfires, the temperate? Uh, soil layer become more like tropical soil layer? Soil layer? So in terms of the tropical, with that soil order I referenced, the oxisols being highly weathered, many of our poor soils here in the southeast are in the ultisol order. And the, the fate of ultisols with continued weathering over time would be moving to even more highly weathered like oxisols. So that, that could occur over time. You also need a lot of precipitation um, to leach a lot of the base cations and other nutrients out. Uh, but we're talking, you know, 
thousands and thousands of years uh, for that to occur. So these stands, you know, these eucalyptus regnum stands with that extreme productivity, a lot of them, they're aging at about 300 years. So this is a cover type that can get tremendous productivity without being extremely old. So what other ecophysiological factors can we think about that are capping out productivity on our tropical forest? Well, what's a disadvantage in the tropical forest if you're trying to store a lot of biomass and carbon? High decomposition rates? Yeah, so you have high decomposition rates and what's causing that? <laughs> so it's a, it's a combination of moisture and temperature. You have plenty of moisture and with plenty of moisture that allows biological activity to occur. So if, if you have very little available moisture, you're not going to get very high decomp rates, but lots of moisture, so they get plenty of decomp there, and high temperatures. So if you look at all the organisms, um, the bacteria, fungi, and other microorganisms that are our primary decomposers, they're going to work faster at higher temperatures. Biological rates, remember, have a Q10 of about two on average which means every 10 degrees centigrade you increase, they double the rate of that biological activity. And so you're getting those really high decomp rates. So we're gonna see probably a lot less sequestration in the litter layer in the tropics than we would in the boreal forest. A lot less sequestration of carbon in the soil in the tropical areas than we would in the boreal forest. But if we look at this, this is above ground living biomass, right? And so what's, what's the factor kind of like decomp that's going to affect the amount of living biomass you can store? Yeah, so I mean, we've got plenty of space in all these areas. We're looking at this on a per hectare basis. So we're, we're evening out space. So what else is temperature controlling in living trees? So it's controlling photosynthesis. What else? Respiration rate, right? So respiration rate is the carbon out. That's organisms losing carbon to keep their cells alive or to grow new cells. And at higher temperatures, the respiration rate is going to increase. And so the idea here behind this trend you're seeing is that in the tropical forest, you've got great growing conditions. Absolutely. Lots of moisture, lots of temperature, long growing season. But those consistent high temperatures are actually increasing your respiration rates. So think of it this way, you can always draw an analogy between these carbons, pools, and fluxes we think about to income and then income taxes, right? So in this case, you're in an area with really high income, but a really high tax rate. So what they get to keep, that's biomass. That's what's left after you pay your taxes. In that case, respiration would be the tax, okay? So very high productivity, very high carbon in, but also very high carbon out in respiration. What's some of the growth over here in the boreal forest? This is probably about what most of us would expect. I would think that that would be the lowest. Yeah, you have a very short growing season, low temperatures, and so there's very little biological activity during much of the year. Um, once you're below about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, your you know biological activity slows down in trees to very very little, and so they're really not photosynthesizing for the most part below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And if they're not photosynthesizing, their respiration rates are also going to be pretty low. And so with those low temperatures, you just, you don't have as much growth. So their overall income is low. They're at a pretty low tax rate, but their overall income is low. So they get less overall growth. Now, this being said, of all these regions, you probably have the greatest uh, litter layer carbon accumulation and the greatest soil organic matter accumulation in this boreal region because you're getting very low inputs, but the inputs that you do get decompose very, very slowly because temperature is so low, okay? And then if you get into the temperate region, it, it's sort of gonna be that Goldilocks zone right in the middle, where in this extreme case um, of these eucalyptus reckon stands, they're getting a lot of moisture. So you're looking at, you know, 80 inches of rain or so more a year. So lots of available moisture, so that's not gonna be limiting growth, but it's also cooler. Okay, this is in the southeast corner of Australia. And so it's at a latitude such that it's going to be cool enough that you're not really getting those really high um, respiration rates. So it's kind of right in the middle where you get good growth, not too much respiration. And so that's what allows them to accumulate such large biomass. So maybe not what we would expect, but if you start looking at all these pools and fluxes we're talking about today, they really do explain the forest productivity. Uh, that we're going to see throughout the entire world 
um, and in the U.S. here. So to bring this a, a little closer to home, here's a map of the southern U.S. And what we're looking at, CAI is current annual increment. So this is the amount of wood you're producing per year in cubic feet per acre. <laughs> and uh, what they've done here, they've assumed that you're looking at a lavalier pine plantation. They've assumed for all these that our leaf area index is four. So that's going to be a high leaf area index for a lavalier pine plantation. So what we're saying there is, okay, if you don't have soils limiting growth, you don't have deficiencies of nitrogen, phosphorus, so you take that out of the equation and you model sort of the climate, precipitation and temperature across the south, this is where we think we can get the best productivity. And so as you start looking at this, you know, in East Texas, our greatest productivity is going to be down here near the coast, because that's where we're getting generally the most precipitation. So do we have a lot of fine plantations right down here? No, that's going to be coastal prairies and urban development primarily. Um, now, where we do have a lot of fine plantations, it's going to be right in this region. So we still have pretty good productivity. But as you start going up into Northeast Texas, Southeast Oklahoma, and Arkansas, you start getting lower potential productivity um, due to that climate changing um, across the South. And so this isn't the only piece of information that you would use if you're working for a company and you want to buy new land to you know, grow pine trees on uh, to feed your mills. But this is one important piece of information that they do consider. Uh, where is that productive ground going to be? So let's think a little bit about what makes up a tree. And so when we start looking at what makes up a tree, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen add up to 96% of a tree's dry mass. So this is dry mass, meaning you've already heated it up to get all the water that's in the vessel elements or the tracheids out of the tree. So you've lost all that free water. Um, typically, the dry mass of a tree versus the green mass right after you cut it down, the dry mass will be half of that. So half a standing tree's weight at any point in time on average is just going to be water in that stem. So, okay, so if we start looking at it, what molecules in that tree are we going to have such that 96% of its mass is just those three elements, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen? So what actually makes up a tree from a molecular perspective? So what do you learn in wood tech? What makes up wood? <clears throat> so lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose. If you go and you look at the chemical formulas for lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose, you get those organic chemistry drawings, start looking at the atoms that are in those molecules, and it's all carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And so a big chunk of a tree's mass is going to be wood. Is wood alive or dead? Much of it's going to be dead. Much of the xylem is going to be dead. So it's just those chemicals, lignin, hemicellulose, cellulose, uh, made up of those molecules. But let's start thinking about some of the other molecules that you might find in a tree. So we know trees need to photosynthesize. We know that's occurring in the leaves. And we know that's occurring within the cells, within the leaves. Okay? So you have to have a living cell within the leaf for photosynthesis to occur. So what's around that cell? What's holding the cell together? Way back to basic biology. So you have a cell wall, okay? And within that cell wall, what's holding the cell together? Your cells all have these. Every cell's gonna have one. Yeah, so you've got a cell membrane. And do you remember how you describe what that cell membrane is made up of chemically? Six years ago? Too long. Mitochondria, <laughs> yeah. So mitochondria are an organelle. <laughs> a little bit. And so remember, you've heard of a phospholipid bilayer? Phospholipid bilayer. So what's a lipid? Fat. It's a fat, right? And chemically, what's a fat? A fat, whether saturated or unsaturated, is a long chain hydrocarbon. It's carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, okay? So you have that lipid bilayer surrounding each cell. So where you have living cells in a plant, there's even more carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Now it's a phospholipid bilayer. You've got phosphorus. It's an important element in cell membranes. 
And so that's where we start picking up some of our phosphorus. Okay, so within that cell now, you have to undergo chemical reactions, right? You need chemical reactions to occur in a cell. Photosynthesis is a chemical reaction. If you leave a chemical reaction to occur on its own, it's going to happen really slowly. So what do cells do that accelerate chemical reactions? What's in a cell that's going to accelerate biological chemical reactions? Yeah, you have enzymes, right? And what makes up enzymes? Yeah, exactly. So proteins are bound together in a complex three-dimensional structure, and that makes up enzymes, which accelerate um, chemical reactions and make life happen as we know it. Um, one of the most common, the most common enzyme on the planet is going to be rubisco. And rubisco is going to be critical to fixing carbon as part of the process of photosynthesis. And so when you start looking at what proteins are, surprise, surprise, they're carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, but they also mix in nitrogen. And so those enzymes made of proteins, which are built up of amino acids, they have a lot of nitrogen. Okay. So when you go and you want to find nitrogen in a tree, it's going to be primarily where those chemical reactions are occurring in that tree. So are you going to find many chemical reactions occurring in the middle of the wood? Not too many. So what do you expect the nitrogen concentration of wood to be? It's going to be low. What tissues do you expect to have a high nitrogen concentration? Cambium should have a high nitrogen concentration, right? What else? Yeah, so sapwood is going to be a combination of cambium and what? Flow, right? So that's, you know, generally moving sugars down to the roots. But you have to look at the other living tissues. We tend to get pretty high nitrogen concentrations in live leaves, okay? Because you have all that rubisco and other enzymes, so photosynthesis will occur. And we also tend to get higher nitrogen in fine roots, because fine roots are actively growing, and so you tend to have more going on there by Okay, um, and then what's the molecule that allows you to transmit traits to your offspring? So within each cell, you've got what that contains the information to make all these proteins? Yeah, you've got DNA that's going to be made up of nucleic acids and surprise, surprise, more carbon, more oxygen, more hydrogen. Um, and then, you know, it's got associated other elements as well. So we know the majority of that tree's mass is going to be that lignin cellulose and hemicellulose, but what did the tree build that out of? So what much simpler molecule do you need to make those complex molecules that make up the structure of a tree? So think about photosynthesis. What are the inputs and outputs of photosynthesis? So you take oxygen in from the atmosphere or from splitting water. So it's not respirating out, yeah. the end products of photosynthesis. But you have oxygen. What else do you have as an input in photosynthesis? Water. You need water. And one more thing. You need CO2. You have two more things in life, right? Okay, so those are going to be our inputs to photosynthesis. So we take CO2, and we take um, water, and we take light. And our output is what? So someone said sugar, glucose, right? And so the chemical formula, <coughs> formula for that is going to be what? It's going to be, yeah, C6H12O6, okay? And so lo and behold, once again, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen uh, for those carbohydrate molecules initially. And so when you start looking at this, we have twice as much hydrogen. Hydrogen is probably the most abundant element in a tree. Why is it such a small percentage of the tree's mass? This is dry mass, you've driven off all the water, but it's still making up most of the atoms in most of those different biological molecules that are still there that we've been talking about. Is it, water? Is it what? Like using water? No, no, so we've dried the tree down. So most of the H2O that was non-structural, it's gone, but we still have all this hydrogen and oxygen left after that non-structural H2O is gone. Yeah. Right? Hydrogen's the lightest element. Okay, there's a lot of it, but it doesn't weigh much. So it only makes up 6% of a tree's mass. Okay? But you got to think about this hydrogen is, is going to be critical. If you want to measure the amount of hydrogen in a solution, what do you call that variable? 
when you measure the amount of hydrogen in a solution. It's going to be an important variable you hear about all the time. pH, right? pH is just a measurement of the amount of hydrogen in a solution, right? Um, and so that hydrogen is going to be critically important in the tree. And so you can see 96% of the tree's mass is carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen because all these different molecules a tree needs to undergo all the biochemical processes to create a tree and grow a tree are made up pretty much of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, potassium is kind of interesting in a tree. Okay, it works the same way it does. I see Glenn has got some blue drink there. So you, you get a lot of drinks these days that have electrolytes <coughs> in them, right? So Gatorade, Powerade, all that stuff. Well, trees have that too. Electrolytes are just, in a lot of cases, free-floating potassium atoms. So potassium in trees generally doesn't form these complex biological molecules or get fixed into anything. It's just floating around in the tree as a K plus ion. It'll accumulate in the guard cells to the stomata, and it's critical to regulating when those stomata open and close, when the tree loses moisture or doesn't lose moisture, allowing photosynthesis to happen. Calcium is going to be really critical in cell wall formation, and they found that trees that start losing calcium, if you're further north, um, they're more prone to winter injury. They've also found that when you over-fertilize lava like pine, you give it a lot of N, P, and K. So N, P, and K are our major macronutrients, but you forget about some of these other things, those trees will start growing up crooked. But if you throw a little calcium out there too, that straightens, straightens them right back out. And so mm -hmm. they have something to do with how their cell walls are forming. Um, and then you end up with lots of other elements. This isn't a complete list here, but just keep in mind, 96% of the tree's mass comes from water it uptakes through the soil or from the atmosphere, okay? We're only talking about 4% when we talk about all these nutrients. And while it's only 4%, it gives us major opportunities in managing our forests. Nitrogen is the most limiting nutrients to plants globally. And so we can make big increases in growth in agriculture and in forestry in many cases by fertilizing with nitrogen. Mm -hmm. But then phosphorus and potassium, they're also gonna come in as pretty critical plant nutrients. Okay, so that's what makes up a tree mass. And you saw 45% of that tree mass was carbon and carbon is sort of that central element in all those different biological molecules we just talked about. So that's one reason we often focus on carbon. Um, the other, of course, is that carbon, the, the largest pool of carbon, or one of the largest pools of carbon is going to be the atmosphere, CO2. We've increased atmospheric CO2 concentration. So now there's a lot of focus on where we want the carbon um, in our entire global ecosphere. Where, where are we going to keep the carbon? And so part of that is forests and trees. So we often track carbon in forests and trees. And so we can think about carbon, we can think about carbon in terms of pools, we can think about it in terms of pluses. And you can do similar exercises for nitrogen, potassium, any of those other elements. Um, but carbon's going to be the one we're focusing on today. Now you probably haven't thought about carbon in these terms much before, but if you start looking up what some of those pools are, you've had other classes where you've been measuring them. So what's a class where you've measured a pool of carbon, even if you called it completely different terminology? Yeah, so fire management, you're looking at fuel loading, right? You know, what's the fuel? Carbon. What other classes have you measured pools of carbon in? So soils, yeah. You look at the litter layer, the A horizon, you may be looking at different levels of carbon. What else? Yeah, biometrics, right? When you wrap a diameter tape around a tree and use a clinometer to get the height of that tree and you figure out the volume of that tree, well, you, you know, figure out how much that tree weighs from the volume table and between 45 and 50% of that mass is carbon. So you've actually been quantifying carbon, you, you know, would have needed to do a few more steps to quantify carbon, but that's one way that we get estimates on carbon is just do a timber cruise, figure out that volume of biomass from that timber cruise data, and then estimate carbon from there. So you've already been doing this a little bit in a number of classes. You just probably haven't been thinking of it in these, these terms. Some of the fluxes are going to be a little harder to measure. Some of them are straightforward. You can measure, you know, litter falling off a tree, put a bucket out there, catch it, weigh it. You know, that's kind of straightforward. But some of these, you know, these are fluxes of gases. 
You don't really see photosynthesis or respiration happening. It's a flux of gas, right? And so you need specialized equipment to measure that. And that equipment gets real technical and complicated. Um, Cliff and I spent a week up in Nebraska this summer learning how to use one, you know, $78,000 machine that'll measure the flux of gases to allow you to estimate photosynthesis, but really just on like one leaf at a time. And so it's not even doing the whole canopy. Uh, but they have other stuff. They've got big towers, almost like a cell tower you put out in the forest. And it just measures wind speed, which way is the wind going, how fast is it blowing, and it measures CO2 and H2O concentration, water vapor in the air, carbon dioxide in the air. And from all that, you can model, this is how much carbon is going out of the forest at night, respiration. This is how much carbon is coming into that whole forest during the day, photosynthesis. So you can estimate some of these fluxes, but it's very difficult to do and it's very expensive. So what about carbon credits? Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. Most of those carbon credits are not based on a direct measure of carbon. They're based on an estimation of carbon. Um, and so are, are we managing for carbon in our forest here in East Texas? What do you think? Yes, no, seeing some no's, seeing some yeses, lots of don't no's. Uh, believe it or not, Mr. Grogan is managing for us for carbon. And some of you probably have scholarships that are funded in part on Mr. Grogan's management of forests for carbon. And so how that came to be about 25 years ago, a European company looked around the world because they do have carbon markets, often they're cap and trade markets where they say, companies can only emit this total amount of carbon. So we'll divvy that up into permits and we'll sell the permits and then you all can sell the permits to each other. And so in order to get credit for this market that they're in, they need to show that they're storing carbon somewhere in the world so that they can emit carbon and produce whatever product they're making. So this company looked around the world and one of the cheapest places they found to store carbon was old fields in deep east Texas. And they said, we'll take these old fields, we'll grow forests on them, and that'll be a pretty cheap way to store carbon. Um, so the company basically pa paired with our college, identified properties we now have, I think about 3,400 acres and it turns out one of the best ways to store carbon that gets them these credits for their market is just boilerplate pine plantation silviculture. So that old field wasn't storing much carbon, it was just in pasture grass. Now it's in big level of pine trees that are storing a lot of carbon. And we can even clear cut them. That's where you get the money for your scholarships. We can even clear cut them because what are you doing after that? You're planting more trees on there. You're taking that timber to a market. And so it's going into secondary products. It's getting stored in the wall of somebody's house as a two by four. And so we're actually managing forests for carbon even here in East Texas. And even the forests we're not managing for carbon are being impacted by European carbon markets. So there's a lot of pellet mills going in South wide. There's some huge ones in North Carolina. We've got a few here in East Texas. And they basically take low value wood, kind of pulp wood type materials, drive down into pellets, those pellets go into huge barges, they get shipped over to Europe um, and they get burned. And uh, a lot of the energy in uh, the United Kingdom, for example, is coming from burning wood from the US South because that's not geological <clears throat> carbon. They're not burning fossil fuels. Now they're burning carbon where it came from a tree that sequestered it recently. You're gonna grow another tree there and recapture it. So the idea is the net is gonna be zero carbon emissions. So a lot of forest management in our region is actually being impacted by carbon sequestration, even though you don't necessarily realize that. And when you look at it, it looks a whole heck of a lot like timber management too. So when we start looking at those pools and fluxes on this simple diagram, okay, there's things that have been going on in a forest that you probably never thought about. So think about the last time you walked through the forest, you know, you're walking on the ground on the litter layer there on the soil. You probably didn't even realize it, but there was carbon dioxide coming out of the ground. Not fast enough that it was hissing or anything like that, but it's coming out of the ground. And this carbon dioxide coming out of the ground, that's actually the largest terrestrial respiratory flux of carbon. And so there is more carbon dioxide coming out of the ground from below ground processes and respiration below ground than the trees are emitting above ground from respiration. And so it's because the roots are respiring. So you have that autotrophic respiration below ground, but then fine roots, fine roots, you know, are growing in a really tough environment. How a root grows in the soil, you can think about it like 
trying to inflate a water balloon through a pile of sand. That's what they're doing. They grow by turgor pressure and they have to get in between all those soil particles, move them out of the way and grow in gaps in between that. And, you know, soil will desiccate roots really quickly. It's a tough environment to grow. And so they're dying in droves all the time. It's been hot and dry for a little while around here. So you've got fine roots just dying left and right right now. They die and different fungi and other microorganisms and even some macroorganisms go through them. They help decompose them. They feed on them. Well, then that's heterotrophic respiration. Those organisms are heterotrophs. They don't make their own carbon. They consume carbon that's been released by trees and they release it out of the soil surface as well. So there's lots of carbon coming out of the ground. GPP, the best way to think of that is kind of photosynthesis, right? All the carbon that a tree gets comes from photosynthesis. And so we can think of GPP, that, that's, you know, when you get your paycheck, that's your pre-tax, pre-withholding income. That's all the money your employer's giving you, but then respiration, that's going to be FICA, Medicaid, Social Security, state taxes, that's going to be all your taxes. And so what you're left with at the end, that's your take-home money, that's NPP. That's biomass that a tree is able to store. Okay? So NPP is easy to measure. You can do that with timber cruising. That's just biomass you have out there. NPP below ground is a little harder to measure because there's soil in the way. And soil is heavy and difficult to deal with. But NPP below ground is pretty straightforward. That's just your roots. And then GPP, that's tough to measure because you've got to get some estimate of photosynthesis into that tree. And then this respiration out, that's really tough to measure because it varies with time, how much has it been raining, it varies spatially. Um, we heard a story about some researchers that had some equipment and they were trying to quantify this and they were out in a field and they kept getting really high numbers in some areas and they didn't know why. And it turned out there were moles digging through the field. Mm -hmm. And if you put down a chamber and try to get this number right above a mole that's sitting down there panting, you get a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of the soil. So. Yeah, so some of these numbers are really hard to quantify, but they're still important to understand. Okay, and so how we quantify them, this is one of those big cell towers I was talking about that's measuring concentrations of gases in the air and wind speed to sort of predict that. All, all these numbers, we can express them on an annual basis. So we can think about this as metric tons of carbon per hectare per year, or you know, 2,000 pounds of carbon short tons per acre per year. But we often think about them on a per year basis. They're difficult to measure, but understanding them is going to give you a bunch of different information. Um, so Mr. Grogan managing our ST properties, he reports to the company that donated to them to us. They're still getting the carbon credits off them. So he goes out, he does, or he has some of you all go out and you all do some measurements, basic timber cruising stuff. And he takes that and he takes different data from the literature from studies like this one. And he predicts how much carbon we have at any point in time, how it's changed over time. He reports that to the company and they use that for their carbon credits. Are those towers only used like whenever you have a research project or if you see a tower, can you be like, oh, that's, you know, a company doing carbon sequestration? These are few and far between. Uh, these are not everywhere. Um, these, and the areas these are, they're pretty expensive to deploy. Um, and so the areas where these are probably have a lot of research going on. So you know how you go around the experimental forest and you'll find old stuff out there from a research plot like little kitty swimming pools and low fences and stuff. If you go out to an area that has an active idea of covariance flux tower, there's usually all sorts of other instrumentation out there where they're measuring all sorts of other things um, in that study. So. so would those towers be sort of a, a permanent structure? It, it, it's either permanent or you've got them out there for years, a prolonged period of time. Yeah, or until your research money runs out. But um, often the NSF, for example, funds long-term research sites, LTERs, um, long-term ecological research. And some of those have these out there and they've been out there for 10, 20 years uh, collecting long-term data. They do have some smaller ones that you could like take out into a grassland because in a grassland, maybe they only have to be five, 10 feet tall. So there's some smaller ones, but in a forest, they've got to be pretty big. So you probably have never seen one of these unless you've gone to some specialized forest service research site or, or something like that. The odds are you probably haven't seen one. Okay, so as we start putting all that together, 
know it's, it's complicated, lots of acronyms, but if we start thinking about it, it starts tying in really nicely to what we already understand about stand dynamics. Um, so if we look at this curve, you have time on the x-axis, you have some metric of growth on the y-axis. What would you call this curve? You've probably seen curves like this in different biology classes. What would you call this curve? Yeah, so this is gonna be a logistic growth curve and we've got a few key phases in it. Why is it leveling off up here? Yeah, you've hit carrying capacity. Respiration may be really high. That may be part of why you're hitting carrying capacity. And we'll get into that in a minute. But I mean, if you have bacteria on a Petri dish, eventually they consume all the agar, all the growth medium, all the sugar you put in there basically. They get as many cells as they can and growth tapers off. So it could be bacteria in a Petri dish. This is often how an individual tree will grow as well. Okay, so you've got sort of that carrying capacity phase at the top. This little phase right here is called the lag phase where it takes a little while for biologic organisms to start growing. If, if you go out and you plant a tree seedling in the ground, how much wood can it gain in a given year as a seedling? Not much, right? So think about it like those cartoons where someone ro rolls a little snowball down a mountain. And by the time it gets to the bottom, it's huge, but it's, it first starts rolling, it takes a while to grow. And so that's our lag phase. But then here between them, you've got this period of exponential growth, right? Uh, where growth is just very, very rapid. And this will happen in trees as well. And so as we start looking at what's going on here, well, we know where trees are getting their carbon that makes up 45% of their mass. They're getting it from photosynthesis. We know photosynthesis is occurring in the leaves. And we know one of the key ingredients for photosynthesis is light, okay? If you're light and you can measure light in terms of the density of photons in certain wavelengths. Um, and so we've got light coming out of these lights in this room right now. We could bring in an instrument and it would probably tell us in a room like this that you've got a really low light level compared to going out on a full sunny day. On a full sunny day, you might be getting 2000 uh, micromoles of photons with the right wavelength for photosynthesis hitting a square meter area in a given second, okay? In this room right now, that number's probably five, 10, okay? Outside it would be 2,000 on a bright sunny day. And so we've got all this light coming in, but if the light level got real low, if we went and got a leaf off a tree outside or brought a seedling from outside inside right now, there might not be enough light for it to photosynthesize very much at all because there's just not enough light to run the chemical reactions that require light. And so at low enough light levels, Photosynthesis isn't really working well. And so as you look at a tree, its canopy can only get so deep because eventually you get that beam of light coming in. And down here, there's just so little light, it can't photosynthesize much. But even before it gets to that point, think about what the tree is doing, okay? A tree is not like you or I, where it only has two arms and two legs, right? A tree has limbs, but it has lots of different limbs that are all functioning pretty much the same way. And so when you look at this limb on this tree, at some point it gets shaded enough. And what it says is, okay, the photosynthesis from all the leaves on this limb are bringing me X amount of carbon. But the respiration to keep that limb alive is costing me more than that. And so why on earth is the tree keeping this limb? The limb has basically become a parasite on the tree. It's using more carbon than it's gaining. And its only function is to gain the tree carbon really, right? And so what's the tree do? Okay, it's like an Arby's or a Wendy's in Nagadoshans. It says that that branch is not profitable. It closes it down, okay? <laughs> and so you don't need that anymore. It's losing the big company money. So it closes it down, it kills it, it prunes, okay? So that's why you have self-pruning. In a Wapole pine tree, they're shade intolerant trees. So if you look at the live crown, regardless of how tall that tree is, the live crown is probably 25 to 30 feet because once you go through 25 to 30 feet of live lava like pine crown, there's not enough light left for it to make sense for the tree to keep those leaves and branches alive. So it kills them off basically. And so we have that light attenuation through the canopy. The other thing you wanna think about with the canopy is how wide can a tree crown get, okay? So around here, we have some really wide trees like live oaks, but have you ever seen a live oak that's got a crown a quarter mile wide? There's some limit on how wide tree crowns get. Okay, so at some point, a tree puts on as wide a crown as it can in the area it's growing in, 
It puts on as deep a crown as it can in the area it's growing on. And then the other thing that's not really shown in this diagram, it gets it as efficient as it can. Big trees are actually more efficient than small trees. If a photon of light hits a big tree, it'll make more wood than that same photon of light hitting a small tree in a suppressed crown position, okay? So they get as efficient as they can. They're getting the most bang for their buck out of each photon of light. But once it does all that, it's maxed out GPP. It's maxed out its income, okay? It's hit the top of its pay scale and it can't get any more carbon in. It's already maxed out. At the same time to do that, it has to get bigger and bigger and bigger, which means the stem gets larger and larger and larger, right? The branches get larger and larger and larger. It gets more and more large limbs up there in that canopy. And each of those limbs is sheathed in live tissue, okay? The main stem is sheathed in live tissue. It's got the cambium, it's got the flow. They're respiring. So that's a carbon cost. So as the tree gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets more leaves, more fine roots, and more surface area. That's more live tissue it has to keep alive. That's moving it into a higher tax bracket, basically, right? It's got a larger and larger cost just to keep the living tissues it has alive through respiration. And so respiration goes up and up and up and up. And eventually, at some point, it's maxed out the carbon it can get in, the canopy, through photosynthesis. And then it's got a lot of live tissue, so it's got this high respiratory demand. And once this ratio of carbon gained through photosynthesis over carbon lost through respiration, once that ratio equals one, so basically all the carbon it's gaining is going out to respiration, it has no carbon left to grow, okay? And so growth basically drops to zero. It's using all the carbon it's getting just to If you think about this too, once that tree gets really, really big and has all this respiratory demand, that also means it doesn't add as much free growing to make defensive contact. So when you go out and factory cultivate these types of plants, trees, if you're actually bringing in due to problems with trees, and you're finding, you know, heart rot, you know, all sorts of issues with trees, you're generally not seeing a lot of that in small, rapidly growing trees, right? You're seeing it in big trees with big canopies because they're at this point where they're having a harder and harder time defending themselves. Okay, and so if I flip back to that curve here, so that, that's why the crown can do that. So let's look at applying some of these concepts. Um, so here's a big table, lots of data on it. Um, and if we look at explaining this data, you've got biomass. So that's going to be tons of carbon per hectare. Yeah, metric tons of carbon per hectare. So that's biomass. You've got GPP, that's carbon in in a given year. So that's megagrams per hectare per year. A megagram is a metric ton. A million grams, it equals just over a US short ton. So it equals what, 2,200 pounds, give or take. Uh, we've got NPP, that's how much carbon the tree is getting to keep in a given year. We've got autotrophic respiration, heterotrophic respiration, and then RE is ecosystem respiration. So that's kind of all the respiratory fluxes going out of that whole ecosystem from whatever source. And then instead of NPP, we have NEP, net ecosystem production. So the difference between NPP and NEP is that ecosystem production is now accounting for, you're also getting litter layers, so carbon sequestration. So it's accounting for a few other pools that NPP does. And then we've got a couple ratios for you here. Here's autotrophic respiration divided by gross primary productivity. So that's gonna be basically carbon out of the tree divided by carbon into the tree. So it's giving you that ratio there. And then NEP over GP. So that's going to be net ecosystem production divided by GPP. So if we look at some scenarios here, let's say you're working for a big company and your boss tells you, okay, we want to acquire new land, one acre of each of these different cover types in different parts of the world costs us the same amount, okay? Costs us the same amount so we don't have to worry about different costs for each of these acres of land. And our objective with our company is we're gonna go in there, we're gonna clear cut the land, we're gonna sell. You may not be working for the most ethical company, but 
That, that's the situation you're in. So if that's the case and that's your job, which of these variables do you care about and why? Okay, so net primary productivity, that's how much biomass you're getting in your trees each year on each hectare of land, acre of land, okay? So that's, you kind of think of that as growth. That's annual growth. Think of that like current annual increment, how much growth you're getting in a given year. So if you're going in there and you're clear cutting it immediately and selling the land, do you care how fast it's going to be growing? Not really, right? Okay, that's not your company's philosophy. So what do you look at on here? Yeah, you could look at biomass, right? That's what's out there standing right now. This is what you're putting on a log truck, right? So what do you end up going and buying? Thug fur. Thug fur has way more biomass than any of these other ecosystems that we have data on. So Doug fur would be the answer, okay? Well, let's say your boss tells you that and you're like, eh, this doesn't sound sustainable and I really don't like this. And you get a job at a better company. And now the boss at the better company is telling you, okay, here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna acquire land and one of these cover types, it all costs the same. And our management philosophy is we wanna manage that land for three generations. That's our objective. So they've got more of a sustainable philosophy. Now, which of these numbers becomes more important? So GPP is gonna to be total carbon in. So our, if you're managing, they're managing for timber, okay? They're managing for timber, but sustainably now, do you really care how much carbon total is coming in? If you cared about carbon total coming in, if we go back to that example at the very beginning of class, you would buy tropical forests, right? Tropical forests probably have the most coming in, but we saw you know, on that graph, they didn't necessarily have the greatest volume out there in the standing trees. So what do we need to look at? Yeah, but over three generations. So you're managing for timber long term. Yeah. So what, what do you care about just in you know regular English words? If you want to manage an acre of land for producing timber long term, what is it that you care about? Right. Growth. You care about growth. Site index, higher site index gives you more growth. That's growth you care about. Site index gets you to growth, right? And so which of these variables is telling us growth? NPP, right? Now the NPP becomes important. And if you look at that, which land are you acquiring? Southern Pine, there you go. It's got the highest NPP because over time that's gonna get you the most growth. And let's, let's look at why, and let's look at another variable that's not on here. So we see Doug fir, 870, Southern Pine, 144. So the Doug fir has way more standing biomass, but then look at NPP, 11 versus Southern Pine, 36. Why is it the Doug fir has more standing biomass but less NPP? What's going on there that's not on here that could explain that? Yeah, age, right? We don't have age of any of these stands. So this could be a much older stand than that Southern Pine stand, and that's why you see that. And so if we go back to our logistic growth curve, the Doug fir might be up here. The Southern Pine might be right here, okay? So look at what we do in pine plantation silviculture in the South. You plant a stand. It grows slow for a few years. But then it starts growing really fast. And then by the time it gets here, what do you do? You clear cut it and you do that again. You keep doing that over and over and over again. And so you're managing your land in this exponential growth phase almost all the time. You're not allowing it to hit understory or initiation and then old growth because then you would be up here and you're not maxing out growth on that acre of land. And so that dug first stand was older, had higher standing biomass, but it's not growing as fast. And if we look at that a little bit more, some of these numbers are a little bit more surprising here. So look at this 93%. 93% of the total carbon that tree is getting through photosynthesis is used in autotrophic respiration. Okay. So would you, would you go and work a job if your tax rate was 93%? I worked hard this week. I made $100. I get to keep seven. Right? No. Okay. That's what this Doug first stand is doing. It's, it's, you know, it, it's way up there at carrying capacity, lots of standing biomass, lots of big live trees, and it's using everything it can get just to keep that large standing biomass alive. So it doesn't have a ton of extra carbon to allocate towards growth, defensive compounds, a lot of other things. 
So this is likely a stand late in understory initiation or even in old growth. You know, this is probably a stand that's hundreds of years old by the time you get to that point. Look at the Southern Pine stand. Would you be happy on your paycheck if you had a 53% tax rate? You'd still be pretty angry, right? Okay, that's not good, but what it's telling you is it may be about as best as we can do. Beach in Denmark was at 43%, but other than that, it's about as good as we can do. So if you think about that, if a tree's photosynthesizing a lot, even in a temperate region where we know they can grow really well, it's still using half the carbon it's getting just to keep itself alive, okay? So that doesn't really sound super efficient, does it, right? So trees can't use all their carbon for growth. They can only use a fraction of it for growth because they got to keep what they have alive. Okay, so let's, let's shift gears a little bit. And we've been talking about carbon in, and we've had that picture of the tree with the hypothetical, um, you know, beam of light going through it. Let's look at how we actually quantify that and actually make that operational in forestry. And we do that with a concept called leaf area index. Now you could put units on leaf area index. You could make it a square foot of leaf per square foot of ground. You could make it a square meter of leaf per square meter of ground. Technically those units shouldn't cancel out because a square meter of leaf is not the same thing as a square meter of ground. They're different variables, but we don't worry about that. We cancel them out and so we say it's units. So you can think of it more simply as simply, you know, here is one layer over one layer of that table. Now I have two layers over that layer of that table. Okay, so that would be a leaf area index of two. Now you can make this a little more complicated. When I'm talking about this layer, am I talking about just the top or am I talking about the top and the bottom? Do I have an all-sided leaf area or just the top only, but one-sided leaf area? So you can make that a little more complicated. This is easy to envision in hardwoods, right? Because a hardwood has a big flat leaf. Think about a pine with you know, a needle on it. It's a little more difficult to think about, but the point is we have equations, we can calculate this and we can estimate how much one-sided or two-sided leaf area there is um, out there based on the, the silvics of the tree, basically. What, what's the nature of its leaf morphology and how it displays them? And more is generally gonna be better. Okay, this is a, a graph from uh, Tom Fox's paper uh, showing us Southern Pines as leaf area index goes up, zero, one, two, three, four, five, we get more growth, okay? So each of these is three tons. So when we start thinking about growth, we'll, we'll look soon at a discussion of mean annual increment, three tons per acre per year, 100 cubic feet equals three tons. That's not very good, okay? If you do really cheap silviculture where you're not paying for much herbicide fertilizer or anything, you don't have great genetics out there, that's kind of, you know, this is what we were doing 50 years ago in the US South, okay? Now you use kind of decent silviculture, you use decent genetics, everything like that, six tons per acre per year. That's kind of at the low end of our Southwide average. Uh, and we're seeing that we're achieving that on average with a leaf area index of two, okay? Now you start getting into industry land, you've got good genetics, good herbicides and establishment, fertilizers, good mechanical site prep as needed. Okay, they're managing the stands at a good density throughout the rotation. Now you're starting to get up into nine tons per acre per year. So think about that, nine tons per acre per year is an abstract number. That means every three years, that acre fills a log truck. Every three years, it fills a log truck with wood. Okay, so that's a truckload every three years. So over a 20 year rotation, that ends up being six, seven loads of logs. Okay, so that's pretty productive. And so up here at nine tons per acre per year, that's the very index of about three. So as we get the higher LAI, we get more productivity. But look at this. But this is telling us, see the dotted lines? That's showing us the range of variability. We have some stands with an LAI of three producing six tons per acre per year. Some stands with an LAI of three producing twice that. 12 tons per acre per year. 12, you'd be super happy with 12. That would be a fantastic fast growing state, okay? And so what, what's causing the difference? Same leaf area index, what's causing the difference? Okay, so when we think about nutrients, that's kind of baked in here. And so the way you can phrase this is nutrients grow leaves and leaves grow trees. And so a leaf area index of three, if you see a stand with a leaf area index of three, what you're thinking is this stand probably is not nutrient limited. No major limitation. There's plenty of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, 
all that out there. So it's probably not nutrients. There, there could be stocking impacts. Yeah, you might have a stand over stock. So that would be something you would want to look at. Yeah. Right, yeah, it's going to be genetics manipulating photosynthetic efficiency. And it's not just that. We can think about efficiencies in lots of different ways. And they're all really controlled a lot by genetics. And so for each unit of water, light, nitrogen, carbon that a tree gets, how much wood can it make? And there's all sorts of different biochemical pathways that influence that. And so some trees may not be making very much wood, even though they have decent leaf area capturing lots of light. Some trees may be making lots of wood, okay? And we see this more and more as we get into clonal plantations where you have stands growing with one genotype, but it's a really weird tree. It'll have a tiny little crown on it, a low leaf area index, but it'll be growing an enormous amount of wood because they clone this one weird tree that's just super efficient. And so that starts sort of throwing a little bit of this out, out, of the, out the window. But So we see differences in growth efficiency that are mostly attributable more than anything to genetics. So. Um, and what we figured out with this leaf area index thing it's really a tool that helps us understand fertilizer. Because for a long time, they would be fertilizing different plantations in the South. In an ag field, you fertilize it, and it either grows better or it doesn't in that one year. And then you kind of have an answer, okay, was this fertilizer worth it or not? It's harder with, with forests because they're long-lived organisms. So our typical nitrogen growth response is six to eight years mid-rotation. So you got to wait a long time as this is sort of playing out in your stand to see, is it really getting better? And so they started looking at a lot of variables to try and predict what stands need fertilizer and don't, what, which don't. And what they came back with is leaf area index. Seems to capture it pretty well. And so I took these two pictures um, at a site in North Carolina called Sea Trees. And you can see this plot over here was pretty open, lots of gaps with no leaves. And then you see there's just sparse foliage on the trees here. This was a sandy site, like at the top of the hill at Tonka, where you all went to at Dendro. So it was a deep sandy site, real crummy soil. And this was a plot they had just grown lava leaf pine. Okay. Some of these had died and there were long leaf pine growing in there. Okay. Because it just low nutrients, low water. We walked 100 yards away and I took this picture up at the crown. And you can see very few gaps. Look at the depth of crown and look at all the needles on there, how dark it is in this stand. And then there you were walking on just a few pine needles and bare sandy soil. Over here, you're standing on like eight inches of bouncy pine straw. Like there's a really thick litter layer over here. Well, what they had done over here, they had fertilized this stand a bunch and they had put out sprinklers and they had irrigated it. Okay. And you had way more leaf area there. The trees were way bigger over here and the trees were taller over here. Same age. So what do we call the height of a tree at a certain age? We call it site index. These two stands are growing on the exact same soil, but this stands a lot taller. Is site index a fixed property of the climate and the soil? No, it's not. If you can afford to fix problems with fertilizer and other treatments. If you can't afford to do that, then yes. Okay, it's gonna be a property of the soils and the climate. But if you can afford silvicultural treatments, we used to think for a long time, site index is a fixed property of that site. And it turns out it's not, if you've got the money to fix problems. So, so there's a lot, and we'll talk about this study a little bit more. So leaf area index ended up coming out of this study is a really important variable. So how do you measure leaf area index? Well, you can go send a grad student, because grad students are cheap, send them out into the woods, and they can take a lot of time catching needles in buckets, and then they can put them in big drying ovens, dry them down, weigh them, figure out area to weight ratio, and get an estimation that way. You think industry is doing this much? That's impractical. It's too much labor. There's other techniques we won't get into today, but this is what turns out one of two things that turns out to be real practical. Here's Landsat imagery. You can get Landsat imagery free from the federal government, and they fly each acre of land in the southern U.S. and the world every 16 days. Okay, so now you've got a free, frequently repeated data source, so it's up to date, and it turns out you can take this free imagery and this study, what they did is they looked at the near infrared to red ratio, a simple ratio, and they regressed it against the variant index that they measured the real laborious. 
that's bad in this sense for the laborious way, and the super cheap, super quick way. Of using that. Okay. Ninety-four percent of the variability observed with the data collected with a lot of time and spent in it. Hmm. Much cheaper, much easier. But now you can feed that into your GIS. So here's Landsat imagery in East Texas. You're going to get a budget for this year. Your budget's going to tell you, okay, we think we can afford to fertilize 5,000 acres. Give me a list of your highest priority stands to fertilize. Well, you can go look at this GIS output and you can say, okay, this stand right here has a leaf area index over three. Is that a candidate for fertilization? Okay, fertilizer is a tool to fix a problem. This stand doesn't have the problem that fertilizer fixes. No, disregard that stand. Okay, look at this stand that's in white up here. It's leaf area index between one and two about. Okay, is that a candidate for fertilization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bet. Okay, should you definitely fertilize it? No, you need more information. Okay, you probably need to go drive around that stand, look at it and say, okay, well, we just thinned this stand down to 60 square feet per acre. Why is the leaf area index low? We cut down over half the trees. So we cut down half the leaf area. So no, that's not a candidate for fertilization. We know why leaf area is low. We think this tool does not work on stands that have just been thinned, okay? Or maybe you go out to this stand and you know there's a beetle outbreak and that's what's going on. Probably not a good idea to fertilize it. But you know, it's not going in the right direction anyway. But maybe you go out and you look at it and you're like, yeah, leaf index is low, but everything else looks fine. Let's try fertilizing and see if we can boost it. So this proved pretty practical. Um, they also have a publication. Um, so th this research was funded by an industry university cooperative. And the industry members pay for the information out of it. So some of this information is not publicly available. So they have a tool behind that paywall, just a sort of little publication, where it'll train field foresters to just look at a stand and eyeball the LIO. So the yeah. Let's look at night. This location. And this is cut over. Cut over site. Yeah, it's nutrients, it's nitrogen specifically. Where's it coming from? Yeah, specifically the slash. When you clear cut a site, you don't go out to a clear cut and find nothing there. You go out to a clear cut and you find all the tops of the trees that were cut down, limbs, leaves, all that stuff scattered all over the place. That's decomposing. Where was the nitrogen in that previous stand? It was in the leaves, which are still on the site. It was in the root, the fine roots, which are still on the site. So all that stuff's decomposing and all that stuff is releasing nitrogen that your little bitty seedlings that are only this big can then take up. And look at this blue dotted line, that's what your stand needs. And what's the shape of that curve? That's our logistic growth curve again, okay? So if you give the trees this amount of nitrogen, that's sort of the, the growth level that they will fuel. So that's their demand, okay? So, should you fertilize cutover sites at establishment at age zero, one, two? You're trying to fix a problem that's not a problem. You're giving them even more nitrogen. And realistically, in the real world, out on that acre of land, what's going to happen to that nitrogen? So, most of it probably doesn't wash away. Some might in some situations. What gets it? Beautyberry, goat weed, it's growing your weeds, okay? So if you then go fertilize, not only are you not fixing a problem for your little pine trees, but you're making a problem for them potentially by feeding weed species that will get that nitrogen. So, um, so you probably don't need to fertilize with nitrogen establishment in most cases. 
We still do that sometimes though, because one of the cheaper ways that we get phosphorus is a fertilizer called diammonium phosphor, diammonium phosphate, DAC. And that comes with nitrogen and phosphorus. So they're putting some nitrogen out often when they fix a, a problem with phosphorus. And we do have problems with phosphorus establishment in many cases. Okay, but then you get to about age five or six. It, you know, this, this is an estimate, it's not exact. But what you find is crown closure. Crown closure occurs. That's when the trees are big enough that nutrients start becoming limiting. So when you look at stem exclusion starting, that's when you start thinking, okay, now nutrients are probably starting to be limiting. Now I have this opportunity to go from where my state is growing on top of this line to maybe up there by applying nitrogen. So the gap between stem potential demand and the top of the available nitrogen, that's an opportunity for fertilizer to grow your stand. Um, the only thing we haven't explained then is this green remobilized pool. Okay, you clear cut a stand. And then you walk into that stand a couple of years later. Is there going to be much pine straw on the forest floor? Much leaf litter? No, it's all decomposed in that full sun, hot. It's decomposed, it's gone. Then you get crown closure. That forest starts building the litter layer back up. And if you ever dig into a litter layer in a forest, you're going to usually find a lot of fine roots. So trees root in there because before they dropped the leaves, they sucked all the nutrients back out of them they could, but they couldn't get them all, okay? And so they drop it, it starts decomposing again, and they basically, they pull nitrogen from the soil, put it into the canopy, drop that back onto the litter layer, and now they're pulling it back into the tree. So that's this remobilization pool that you see becoming increasingly important as that litter layer is reestablished following crown. Okay, but what's the problem with that? And hopefully this is a review for ecology uh, for you all from Dr. Kidd's class. You've got Liebig's law of the minimum, right? And what Liebig's law of the minimum tells us is that you don't like average all these nutrients and that tells you what growth is gonna be. What Liebig's law tells us is the most limiting factor on that stand will dictate growth, okay? And so we use this analogy where you have the barrel. Each stave of the barrel is a potentially limiting factor. And the height of it is the amount of it you have out on your stand. And that dictates how much water you can fill the barrel with. And that water is the growth of your stand, okay? So you can only fill this barrel to the lowest stand. Now, confusingly, in this case, we're using actual water on the stand and metaphorical water in the barrel is the lowest stand. So maybe not the, the best design diagram, but. Um, so here, water is our most limiting resource on this stand. So what you could do, you could fix nitrogen with fertilizer. You could make this stay taller by fertilizing the nitrogen. Can you fit more water in that barrel? No. If you do have a stand that's limited by water primarily, no amount of fertilizer will grow your trees by that. In the US South though, we have almost no stands where water is the lowest stave on the barrel. Um, that sea trees site I showed you that had a soil like 10 foot deep sand, like the top of the hill in Tonka where we went on that dendro lab, when they installed that study, they thought for sure water is going to be the most limiting. This study is going to tell us that unless you can irrigate, there's no reason to fertilize. They got a bigger fertilizer growth response there than they did irrigation growth response. And so the, the, the thinking from that southwide has been that water is not our most limiting resource in the U.S. South. That being said, that study was done in North Carolina, not East Texas. So it'd be interesting to see it done in East Texas to see what would happen, but Forest Service won't give us $10 million to do it like they did in North Carolina. So. Okay, so th this is what makes fertilizer frustrating, okay? Because maybe you throw nitrogen out there and maybe nitrogen really is limiting on that stand, but this stave isn't always water. Maybe this stave is poor. Maybe you've had a micronutrient deficiency you did not identify and you didn't put any more on out there and you just didn't grow the response. Maybe nitrogen's not limiting, but you just miss. You get more into this thing in the semester. Okay. Um, I don't think we have enough time for this. So I'll, I'll post the slides and you can do this if you want. If you want to exercise with the other questions. Any questions on the uh, <coughs> physiology of this carbon fuels, flexes, and Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, they're typically not pulling stumps out of the ground because it's expensive, it's difficult, and it's not 
Now, uh, back when we harvested the virgin from this area in the late 1800s, eventually they went back and got a lot of those stumps, um, and they do this further east in the trees. And they do the 